my dear student colleagues and all the viewers uh, who are watching this program live from facebook page physics center i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar and today it's our 48th international physics webinar so good morning to all hope you are well and uh, safe from corona pandemic so all of we know that we are staying in a corona pandemic situation so it's very difficult for us to continue our uh, uh, normal academic pro program inside the campus so we have to start our online program so our department department of physics Patna university of science and technology have already started some online program including online classes and online international physics webinar and we have successfully completed our 47th international physics webinar it's our uh, 48 we are trying to adjust with the new normal situation today uh, it's a very important day for our department and today i'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between Patna university of science and technology Pabna Bangladesh and Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, uh, Kanpur, India, uh, in nanotechnology. And we have uh, with us here today Dr. Devashish Choudhury, Professor, Department of Physics, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Kanpur, Kanpur, India, connecting with us from India. So he has already connected with us. So I'd like to welcome our speaker. So, sir, uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. And welcome to our uh, international physics webinar. So welcome, also welcome to our university and Bangladesh. Thank you, so, thank you for the. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. So we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics from the University of Science and Technology, sir. So uh, we, we think that this will uh, make a, a very good opportunity for our uh, student to interact uh, with such a, a big scientist like you. So thanks for that. So for those who are new, uh, I'd like to uh, inform that uh, uh, we have uh, organized a series of uh, webinars. And in those uh, in those webinars, physicists from different countries are coming as a main speaker. They are delivering their speech. They're sharing their uh, uh, knowledge with our student. And I think by this way, our students are benefited. So uh, uh, we, we actually divided our webinar into three parts. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce our speaker with all of you and then our speaker will uh, deliver his piece and at the end uh, we have a time in that time anybody can join with us so uh, i think we have already come to know that the, the title of our today's uh, international physics webinar title is uh, the nature's nano machine in the micro factory multidisciplinary approach to machineries of life and our today's speaker is dr devashi choudhury sir Professor, Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Kanpur, Kanpur, India. Dr. Devashi Choudhury sir is a theoretical physicist and he works on a wide variety of topics in statistical and biological physics. After getting his doctoral degree from IIT Kanpur in 1984 for his thesis on spin glass transition, he carried out postdoctoral research as an Alexander von Humboldt fellow in Cologne, Germany, and then as a senior associate uh, research associate in Philadelphia, USA. He was an assistant professor in the School of Physical Science and of John Dunn University, New Delhi, from 1987 to 1992, and as an associate professor in the physics department, IIT Kanpur, from 1993 to 1997. And Dr. Choudhury became a full professor in May 1997. Dr. Choudhury is an elected fellow of the Indian National. Science Academy, New Delhi, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, and the National Academy of Sciences, India, Allahabad. He is a recipient of the Young Scientist Medal of the uh, Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, 1989. He is a former uh, fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Germany, as, and a former associate member of ICTP Italy. He has served as a member of the board of editor of European Physical Journal B, which is a co-published by Springer Germany. EDP, science jointly owned by French Physical Society, French Chemical Society, and France Society of Applied and Industrial Mathematics, and the Italian Physics Physical Society. He was also a uh, managing editor of the International Journal of Modern Physics C, which is published by World Scientific. So if we see his uh, educational and employment history, we can see he completed his uh, bachelor degree from St. Javier College, Ranchi, India, and master's and uh, PhD from IIT Kanpur. And we can see uh, uh, his employment uh, history. You can see sorry, that- uh, This was from IIT Kharagpur and PhD from IIT Kanpur. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, your master's from IIT Kharagpur and PhD from IIT Kanpur. 
so uh, employment history so after phd professor uh, shamnath shares professor indian institute of technology kanpur uh, march 2015 to 2018 and dr jagmohan garg chair professor indian institute of technology uh, kanpur from may 2011 to 2014 and professor hsg higher academic grade pay scale indian institute of technology kanpur from august 2011 to present so prof he also working as a professor at uh, iit uh, kanpur from may 1997 to present uh, associate professor 1993 to 1997 and assistant professor 1999 1987 to 1992 as a visiting faculty iit kanpur 1987 fall semester alexander von hamol fellow and senior associate uh, uh, in 1984 to 1987 at college in germany and philadelphia usa awards fellowship and membership and honor we can see he has got uh, a lot of awards and he is a member from different institute and different uh, society and he also got uh, fellowship from different organ organization so uh, you can see his visiting uh, scientists and professorship from all over the world and members from indian delegation so he is also working as a uh, editor of the chief journal of the below uh, journals so we can see his uh, published uh, some of his published paper and uh, he has also books and chapter of books so we can see his research get id his research get number is 40.01 uh, and uh, we can see his google scholar id and his google scholar citation number is more than 8000 and this is his indian national academy science uh, academy science id so thanks sir we feel proud to host you uh, in our international physics webinar so it's your time sir you can start your session should i start now yeah yeah of course sir you can start okay so uh, before i begin i thank dr das for inviting me to give this lecture so it's a honor and privilege to interact with uh, uh, colleagues from bangladesh so uh, of course because of the pandemic i am giving this lecture online i hope some day after pandemic is over we will meet in person and i will yeah. give the lecture uh, in the presence of all of you in front of me so let me now uh, share the screen full screen okay so the title of the talk as was announced is nature's nano machines in a micro factory a multidisciplinary approach to machineries of life so let me begin at the beginning first thing is what is a machine a machi machine is a input output device so there is some input and there is some output what is input and what is output well if the input is energy and output is also energy we normally call such machines as engine but it need not be always input energy and output energy it is possible that you have a situation where you have matter input and matter output and chemists deal with such situation quite often almost all the time and the engine in that case is essentially an enzyme which is a catalyst which converts input matter into an output product well we are all familiar also with computer and their input is information and output is also information so to summarize machine is a very generic term and depending on what is input and what is output we have engines enzymes and computer and people deal with these objects in different disciplines and different departments so physicists most of the time are interested in engine whereas chemists are interested in enzyme and computer scientists or in some sense all of us are also users of computers so this is the my definition of machine some input and some output now man machine analogy has attracted some of the greatest thinkers of all times and i'm sure all of you are familiar with these names aristotle leibniz descartes uh, delametri delametri may not be familiar to all of you but i'm sure the first three are very Uh, famous all of them are famous but first three are probably familiar to all of you so they had drawn analogy between man machine in other words they said that man is almost like a machine by man i mean not only man but man woman all includes included in the word man now it's amusing to see that this man machine analogy actually sometimes in a can confuse one 
on the left, I have shown a real man, man on moon. And on the right, I have shown a robot. And that is a machine. Now, unless you are told, then sometimes it may be difficult just from a you know, photograph to say which one is actually a living man and which one is a machine. So that's why the analogy is sometimes you know, very interesting. And on the left, I have a really living object, namely man. And that's why I have put machine within the quotation mark that it behaves sometimes analogous to machine. On the other hand, what I have on the right is a robot, which is indeed a machine. And I have put living within quotation mark because it behaves in a way that sometimes appear that it is as if living. So this concept of man machine in you know, analogy in biology goes, of course, thousands of years. However, in this talk, I'm not interested in the analogy between man and machine at the level of a whole organism. So what am I interested in? So before I do that, let me again draw your attention. Analogy with machines at different levels of biological organization. So first I look at movers and packers at the level of organs, namely heart. The heart itself is an organ and it behaves almost like a machine. And on the right, I have shown the, you know, the cover page of a very famous book by John von Neumann. And uh, there, you know, he had drawn analogy between brain and computer. So these are information processors and these are organs of the body. Now, analogy that I have between machine and something in the living system, that analogy starts at the highest level, namely the level of organism, which I have shown in the previous slide. Then I go to the level of organ. There is a similarity between the organs and machines. I can go down to the level of a cell and the cells also behave as if they are machines. But in this talk, I'm going down to much smaller level. And my interest is in the, the bio, sorry, sorry for this. Uh, somehow this has moved. Uh, okay. uh, I'm interested in biomolecules and macromolecular assemblies. And I'm going to convince you that they work effectively as machines. So if you are interested, you can take a look at either of these, either this book on molecular machines in biology edited by Joachim Frank, a Nobel laureate. And there's a chapter in this book written by me. So you can take a look at that. Or if you have access to this physics reports, which I wrote a few years ago, you can uh, get details. And third possibility, if you have access to this book, beautiful book by David Goodsell. So now let me first begin with the history of molecular machine. So the mo machines that I have in mind are actually molecules or macromolecular complexes. So the history goes back all the way to Marcelo Malpighi. And what did he write? Well, this is the English translation of what he had written. Nature, in order to carry out the marvelous operations in animals and plants, has been pleased to construct their organized bodies with a very large number of machines, which are of necessity made up of extremely minute parts, so shaped and situated such as to form a marvelous organ, the composition of which are usually invisible to the naked eye without the aid of microscope. Interestingly, in 17th century, he speculated the existence of these molecular machines and he is recognized as father of microscopic anatomy. And he used microscope for the first time for the study of anatomy. Unfortunately, the microscopes that were available that time were not good enough to actually observe the operation of molecular machines. And these had to wait for a few more centuries. So then we fast forward to this work in a paper by Bruce Alberts who, by the way, was president of the National Academy of Sciences of the US during 93 through 2005. And then he served as editor in chief of this uh, in the high ranking journal science that you are all familiar with. So in this you know, important paper, which was published in Cell in 1998, he wrote this, I'm quoting from his paper. The entire cell can be viewed as a factory that contains an elaborate network of interlocking assembly lines 
each of which is composed of a set of large protein machines. I'm emphasizing the two words here, factory and machines. And why do we call large protein assemblies that underlie cell function protein machines? Precisely because like machines invented by humans to deal efficiently with the, micro, with the macroscopic world, these protein assemblies contain highly coordinated moving parts. So that's how he defines the machines that work inside cell. And since there are a large number of these machines working together, coordinated fashion inside the cell, the cell, entire cell can be viewed as a factory. And since its typical size is of the order of micron or few microns, so I call it a micro factory. And the typical size of these machines is of the order of tens of nanometers. So you can call them nano machines. So what is the challenge then for a scientist? So first challenge number one. Challenge number one is to reverse engineer natural nano machines. So essentially nature has these machines operational for billions of years. And we know that they are operating, but we don't have any diagram telling us what is the design principle used there, what is their software and hardware. So our situation is somewhat like Charlie Chaplin in the film Modern Times. They have these machines working and they're scratching their head. They have to find out how it works. So our situation is like that. Inside the living cell, we have these machines which have been op operational and we have to understand how they operate, what is the mechanism of their operation. Challenge number two. So this is forward engineering, namely synthesis of artificial nanomachines. And I quote from Richard Feynman, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And indeed the first breakthrough success in synthesizing such nanomachines that came from chemists Jean-Pierre Sauvé, James Fraser Stoddart and Bernard Lucas Feringa, and for their you know, uh, work in artificially synthesizing nanomachines, they were awarded Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2016. And Olaf Ramstrong, when he delivered the presentation speech for this Nobel Prize 2016 in Stockholm, he said the following, I'm quoting from his speech. Over the millennia, our society has enjoyed an ever increasing plethora of useful machines for various purposes, in many ways leading to an enhanced quality of our lives. This progress has in particular accelerated since the industrial revolution. Today we are at the dawn of a new revolution that will bring us yet another giant leap forward. The ultimate limit of this endeavor is to make molecular sized machines structures that are less than a thousandth of the width of a human hair. So uh, let me skip this slide. It essentially uh, shows us that molecular machines are distributed all over a living cell. So the outline of the talk. Introduction, I have more or less uh, given the introduction that I intended to. Then I will go through the common operational principles in diverse linear and rotary motors, uh, the question of fuel consumption by these machines, then molecular motor traffic inside cells, then motoring along nucleic acid track, and finally information processing by some machines. It depends on how much time I have at the end and I will continue. So let me begin with the first part, mechanisms of energy transduction, basically energy conversion by molecular motors. So normally when we find something moving, we say it's moving, so it's alive. From well sperm to sperm well, that is from the smallest to the largest, movement is the hallmark of life. And not only the animals move or bacteria move, plants move too. And this was of course emphasized by uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose that most of you must be very familiar with. So movement is hallmark of life. However, at the root of all movements of living system lies movement at the subcellular or molecular levels. And so I'm going to focus on movements that are driven by something called motors. 
So there are two kinds of tracks. So these tracks, biologists have given names. So these are either actin filaments, which are some tracks for some motors. And then there are some other tracks which are called microtubule. These are tracks for some other motors. And what do these motors do? These motors are like porters, pulley. Okay, the porters carry cargo on their head and these motors carry cargo from one end of the cell to another. And so this is the animated cartoon from MCRI UK that is capturing this phenomena. So it's a, just a cartoon. So essentially these motors walk on a track and on their head, they carry cargo from one point to another. So these are machines and these are of interest to us. However, only porters are not the motors. There are other kinds of motors and there are motors who perform the role of sliders and rowers. So you can see some movements on the screen and these movements are also being driven by some other types of motors. In fact, the lower one where I'm showing this rower like operation of muscle myosin, what you see here is something like the bristles of a toothbrush. Okay, these tiny ones, uh, these are the like the toothbrush. And actually these are the motors and the green ones are the filaments and they are grabbing the filament, giving it a kick somewhat like the rowers when they row a boat. And there together, many of them move their oars in and out of water in a manner that the boat moves forward. And our muscle contracts by a mechanism which is very similar. So in some sense, these motors I like rowers and similarly some other motors can slide filaments which are shown in the figures at the upper panels so motors basically are machines and these machines can either work as porters of cargo or they can slide filaments or they can work as rowers so now let me come to the main point here what is the typical size of these motors the size is of the order of nanometers. How much force do they generate? The force they generate are of the order of pico Newton, 10 to the minus 12 Newtons, and nanometers 10 to the minus nine meters. So the question that I pose, is the mechanism of molecular motors identical to those of their macroscopic counterparts, except for a difference of scale? That means except for the fact that instead of meters, you are dealing with nanometers and instead of newtons, you are dealing with pico newtons. That's my question. And the answer is an obvious no, because if it were so trivial, I would not have done my research in this area and whole world there are a large number of people work on this simply because they are very unlike their macroscopic counterparts. So they can do something amazing. Normally we say that noise is a nuisance we should try to suppress or eliminate noise. However, these motors can actually exploit or utilize noise for their movement. So how do they do that? Well, this is a, again a cartoon of a motor which carries cargo by walking on a filament. And what is the typical step size? Typical step size is of the order of eight nanometers. And these motors are really proteins that are there inside some cells. So it's not a fiction. This is reality. And what is very peculiar is this particular one that I'm showing on the screen is that they have only one leg. You can call it a lame porter. And that carries cargo. So this was a puzzle for quite some time. How can a lame porter carry cargo over a significant distance within living cells? So this puzzle was solved by our experimental colleagues and then we developed the theory for that which was published quite some time ago. But the beauty of this is the following. The mechanism of that I will explain with the help of this figure. So the track is shown here as the sequence of alpha, beta, alpha, beta, etc. Let me not get into the name of this. What is interesting about that, that they have some charge. So from alpha and beta, these things that are sticking out, these are called E hook. And the motor which carries cargo, that motor moves along this track and it has a part 
which is called K loop, which is oppositely charged. So now what happens, this ATP, which is, whose full name is adenosine triphosphate. So this ATP, that is a fuel and that fuel burns and that is gets converted from triphosphate to diphosphate, it is called ADP. Now what happens that when it gets converted from triphosphate to diphosphate, its affinity for the track, so this is the track, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, its affinity for the track becomes smaller. So it can detach from that track. So motor gets detached, but because of the opposite charge on the motor and the track, this motor cannot go very far from the track. So what does it do? Well, remaining close to the track, it then goes back and forth and it executes what is called a diffusive motion, forward, backward, random movement. And while doing that, of course, gradually, this diphosphate, the burnt fuel, leaves. And then at the end of a cycle, it regains its affinity for the track and it reattaches to the track. But where it reattaches is, of course, dependent on how far it has diffused during its back and forth motion. So it may go further forward. Occasionally, it may go even backward. And this entire phenomenon is called Brownian ratchet. And why is it moving? It is moving not because of the fuel. It is moving because of the random Brownian motion or diffusion. And what is the role of the fuel consumption? Well, fuel essentially reduces its affinity for the track. So it is very unusual. And the way I explain it, let me come to that a little later. So let me point out that it is not only that the linear motor that we considered here that executes this kind of motion or Brownian ratchet. There are others who do similar things. And one classic example of that is this rotary motor, which is somewhat like the rotary motor of a hair dryer, if you have used or seen this. So let me show you how it rotates through this argument. Sorry. I hope you can see the ions are moving into the lower part of the motor. It is rotating and while it is rotating, then something is going on on the upper part. So here the spent fuel ADP comes in and then here in while this lower part rotates, the upper part converts the spent fuel, that means recharges spent fuel to, again, the fully charged fuel. So diphosphate becomes triphosphate again and can be utilized once again. So this is actually world's smallest rotary motor. Typical size is 20 nanometers by 10 nanometer. It's an operational uh, in all living cells. And this has been operating inside living cells for billions of years. And unfortunately, human beings have not been able to design and synthesize anything very close to such a rotary motor. So I don't think I'll have time to go into the details of the mechanism of its operation, but it also is believed to work by a mechanism which is based on Brownian ratchet, the same underlying principle with which the linear motor works. So let me use this cartoon to explain how noise can be exploited for forward movement. Imagine that you have a car and suppose it doesn't have an engine and there is so light that when you have a hailstorm, Shila Brishti, okay, uh, so this is on an inclined plane. It is getting bombarded from all sides and because of bombardment, sometimes it will move forward, sometimes it will move backward. So both are possible. It doesn't have an engine, but suppose it moves forward and then you run after it with some brick or something. And when it's on the verge of going backward, you put that brick there. In other words, you rectify its backward motion, but you allow its forward motion. This forward backward movement is occurring because of the random bombardment by the, uh, you know, in this hailstorm. So somewhat similar happens in the case of this molecular motors. 
they can get bombarded by the molecules of water in this medium from all sides. However, it is only the forward movements which are sort of allowed and the backward movements are mostly rectified. So essentially it is because of this random bombardments by the molecules of water that it essentially moves forward. This is very strange and this is related to a concept that uh, Feynman popularized in his famous Feynman lectures through a device which is called Ratchet and Paul device. So I would urge the students that they should, if they get time, they should look into this lecture by Feynman in a particular chapter and they can find a beautiful discussion on his Ratchet and Paul device. So this is a rotary motor that Feynman considered to explain the concept of Ratchet and much later Phil Nelson uh, made a linear version of that and given in his book on biological physics. So for students, I'm just saying that if they want to understand in detail this wonderful mechanism of Brownian ratchet, then they can either go to Feynman lectures or they look into Phil Nelson's book on biological physics. Now, one fundamental question here is that at first it may appear that this object is violating second law of thermodynamics. How? Because if the random bombardment by the molecules of water is good enough for moving forward in a directed manner, then the ships or boats could have moved in ocean or in river just by the random bombardment of the molecules of water in the medium and they would not require engine or fuel. But then you know that second law of thermodynamics says that is impossible. Then how does a molecular motor achieve this? Well, the reason is that the molecular motors work far away from thermodynamic equilibrium. These are non-equilibrium systems. And so the laws of thermodynamics are not directly applicable to them. And so there is no violation of second law of thermodynamics in case of the molecular motors. So let me skip this again. These are just examples of many motors that I'm familiar with. Let me come to the question of what is the fuel and you know, there are some interesting aspects of the fuel consumption. So the fuel that these motors use is adenosine triphosphate or guanosine triphosphate, ATP or GTP. So these triphosphates get converted to diphosphate as is shown here in this figure. So triphosphate is a high energy compound and diphosphate is lower energy one. So once triphosphate is made, you would imagine that naturally it will get converted to the lower energy product, namely diphosphate. But if this spontaneous reaction went on all the time, it will be so much of wastage because you know we keep eating food and then that food gets converted to the triphosphate. And if just triphosphate spontaneously gets converted to diphosphate, then to make up for that wastage, we would have to eat all the time. Now, of course, that's a wastage of energy. So the best way nature has done is that between ATP and ADP, the, there is a huge energy barrier. And this reaction can proceed forward only if this barrier can be crossed. And this barrier can be crossed by thermal energy. Now, the barrier is so high compared to thermal energy KBT that it is practically impossible for spontaneously this to occur. However, these motors or machines that I was discussing, they are also enzymes, that is catalysts. And what does a catalyst do? It lowers the barrier, energy barrier. And when required, it lowers the energy barrier. This conversion takes place. This amount of energy is released. And part of that energy release is its input energy and gets converted to output. So when it needs the energy, then it you know, then uh, catalyzes the reaction which essentially burns the fuel. It does not unnecessarily burn the fuel. And this is related to something that I will explain in a few minutes. Now, to some of you, it may appear that it's all storytelling and there is no theory involved. That is not true. I'm just not showing it. And one equation that we use extensively in our studies is called master equation. So what is this master equation? In master equation, essentially, the system is represented as if it's a frog. And the states of the system are like the lily ponds, I mean, lily, you know, the, the lily pads in a pond. Okay, so the lily pads are shown by these green uh, patches, and the transitions of the machine from one state to another 
is essentially like jumping from one lily pad on the pan uh, in the pond to another lily pad on the same pond so there is a you know a theory, very sophisticated theory behind all this but because there are students undergraduate students are in the audience i will skip this i will only mention few interesting aspects little later well it's already here sorry i forgot that uh, when we apply this uh, using something called algebraic graph theory it turns out that is very much like what is called kirchhoff's law for electric circuits and so the theorems that we use here essentially are the results that kirchhoff had sort of derived you know when he was analyzing circuits electric circuits so the register circuits that you use for finding the voltages at the nodes of an electric circuit and the currents going through the registers in the circuit so that kind of theory is applied here now the engines that physicist is familiar with that engine has a similarity with what is called chemochemical cycle of an enzyme so an enzyme converts so it's a catalyst it converts atp into adp so what a chemist deals with is an enzymatic cycle and what a physicist deals with is something like this cycle of carno when if you have studied carno's engine and there is a similarity between them similarity goes quite deep however i will not go into that deep discussion only thing i would like to mention that in the context of this chemical uh, reaction catalyzed by the enzymes a very famous relation was known for more than 100 years and this is called michaelis menten relation and this michaelis menten relation comes also into the picture when you deal with this molecular machines because these machines are catalyzing the burning of the fuel and there this uh, equation again comes up in fact not only this there are a large number of situation where this michaelis menten formula comes up so the naturally one would like to understand why this formula is so ubiquitous it appears in so many different places what is the explanation of this ubiquity ubiquity means it appears on so many different contexts which apparently look very different from each other but everywhere you find the appearance of this michaelis menten formula so this puzzle was solved uh, two years ago by uh, me my student onisha and our collaborator jeremy uh, gunavardhana from harvard university and his student felix wong from harvard university and we explain with the help of graph theory uh, which he published in, in this paper in pns uh, then we answer this question you know when the michaelis menten formula will appear and when it will not appear now when you have motors obviously you may ask that can there be traffic jam after all when the motors we see on our highways and we see traffic jams why can't such a thing appear inside living cells well such things do happen inside living cells traffic jams do occur and experimentally these have been observed so we have developed theory of motor traffic inside living cells so there is sort of a you know similarity between the cartoon on the left where you find that cars are moving on the highways and motors are moving on the filaments and in fact my collaborator uh, yashushi okada he did the experiments and these are from his experiments that i'm showing you and when you see these red dots these are the motors and at high densities of course at the lowest panel you see very dense packing of these red dots essentially you see traffic jams there now one interesting related question is the following that if you look at our nerve cell which is shown here uh, on the right lower panel this nerve cell has long extension is called axon and here the materials are carried transported over a very long distance which in human being can be as long as a meter so over a distance which is of the order of a meter the cargo have to be carried by this tiny motors so the question is how do they achieve that not only that if you look at this uh, algae called chlamydomonas reinhardti so they have this extension called flagella so these extensions they are of the order of 12 microns and then the question 
is two things. How do they maintain this length 12 micron? And how do they know that they have to maintain the length at 12 microns and not at 5 micron and not at 15 microns? In other words, do the cells have rulers, scales to measure length? And what we have shown is that the cell uses a timer and the timer actually plays the role of a ruler or a scale. Again, some details that I cannot get into, but the point is that this long extension of the flagellum, this is maintained by material su supply. And these materials are synthesized in the cell body. They are not synthesized in this extension. And so they have to be transported and they are transported by molecular motors. So motors actually do wonderful things as transporters. So, you know, this is how this uh, uh, algae uh, swims with the help of its flagella, which are sometimes called cilia, and they are maintained by cargo transport. And this transport is done by molecular motors. And this work has been done uh, by me in collaboration with my students, Shwam Patra from IIT Kanpur and my collaborators, uh, collaborator Frank Julichel, who is a director uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden. Again, some details which I will not get into, but interestingly, you know, I will just mention one aspect of it. So what is shown in the lowest panel here is what happens if the uh, flagellum is cut. So with the help of a laser, you can cut a flagellum of this algae, which have two flagella. If you cut one, it can regrow. It can regrow, that may not be surprising. What is even more surprising, that when it starts regrowing, the other one, that starts shrinking, as if it has sensed that my partner has been cut. So it shrinks. And how long does it shrink? It shrinks as long as the other one grows and catches up. So once their length becomes identical, which is shown by the graph on the lowest panel here, then both of them start growing again and they regain their original length, 12 micron. And this wonderful thing, who actually drives this process? It is again, these tiny molecular motors carrying cargo. They are supplying the materials required for the you know, regaining of the length of this flagella. So it's a wonderful phenomenon, the motor driven transport. I could have gone on and on, but I guess my time is almost up. Let me see how much time do I have. Uh, okay, so I have another 10 minutes or so, I guess. So let me now say that, you know, all the motors that I have discussed so far, those are transporters of cargo. But there are other motors who do not transport cargo. What do they do? Well, they do information processing, somewhat like computers. But they move on some tracks like other motors. And these tracks are of a different nature. These tracks are either DNA or RNA. And what I'm showing here uh, in this on this slide, these uh, motors are called ribosome. This is one of the largest uh, macromolecular machines working inside living cells. And that is essential for every cell. Without them, we will all be dead. So what do these cells do? I mean, these machines do. These machines, when they move like motor along a track, which is called RNA, messenger RNA, in each step, they elongate a object, which is eventually it becomes a protein. So they synthesize protein, but for that, they move along a track in a step-by-step -step manner. And the structure of this was discovered by uh, Ramakrishnan, Stiles, and Yonath, and they jointly won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2000. Nine. So this is a machine on which we have done a lot of work. So I'll just you know, mention a few interesting things. So we have looked at the stochastic thermodynamics of this. So it's a big name for a very ele elementary concept. So let me explain. So we are all familiar with uh, this thing uh, because whenever in our childhood we have gone to park, we have enjoyed this. So you know what I'm showing here is essentially a mechano-mechanical machine. The input is mechanical, this heavy object falls. So this is a mechanical input. And this smaller object rises. It rises against gravity. And so this is mechanical output. 
mechanical input, mechanical output, it's called a mechano mechanical machine. Then, you know, when you have a chemical input and chemical output, so you can call the object which does it like our enzyme. This is a chemo chemical machine, chemical energy input and chemical energy output. Now we can imagine a thermochemical machine. So if we have a thermal energy input, okay, I'm sorry, I should have written here thermomechanical machine. Sorry for this. It's a thermomechanical machine because the thermal energy is flowing from a reservoir at a higher temperature to a reservoir at a lower temperature and mechanical work is getting done. So it should be thermomechanical machine. But you can also have you know, other kinds of machine and that is what is shown here on the left lower panel. So here chemical energy is the input. So basically ATP is getting converted to ADP, triphosphate getting converted to diphosphate and some amount of energy or more precisely free energy is given out and this motor is utilizing part of it to do mechanical work when it is carrying cargo but part of this energy is dissipated as heat flow and that goes into a heat reservoir or thermal reservoir. So this is the kind of objects that we deal with when we deal with molecular motors. So they are driven chemically. So that's why chemical energy input, but they do mechanical work. So output is mechanical. And this ribosome machine that I mentioned, that is much more complicated. It is coupled not to just in a few and a one or two reservoirs, a typical one that was shown earlier was coupled to a chemical reservoir, a thermal reservoir and a mechanical reservoir. A ris ribosome is coupled to quite large number of reservoirs and it operates by some, its, its motion is governed by the laws of thermodynamics, but laws of thermodynamics at a nanoscale. And there we call it stochastic thermodynamics. So we have developed the theory of stochastic thermodynamics of such a machine, namely ribosome. And this work was done in collaboration with my student, Anesha Dattu, and my longtime collaborator, Gunther Schutz from Ulysses, Germany. So stochastic kinetics, what is stochastic? Stochastic basically means random movements. And so, you know, we use a concept, again, a concept I'll mention, to so suppose that a drunkard comes out of a bar and it has to go to its house and if we ask the question when does it you know reach its house it's not a well-defined question because the drunkard will may not be able to recognize its house and may overshoot go beyond that and he may do few times until finally maybe he gets uh, where his house is so it's not a well-posed problem but if we ask the question how much time does the drunkard take to reach the door of his house for the first time is a very well posed question. And this is actually the concept behind first passage time, when an event takes place for the first time. And there, the time it takes because of this randomness or stochasticity, this time it takes is of course random. So next time he repeats this, the time will be different. So that's why there's a distribution of these first passage times. But for any distribution, you can calculate the average or mean. And it turns out the rate that we normally calculate, rate is inverse of the mean of the first passage time. So we, we utilize the you know, method. It's a sort of very uh, complicated technical thing that I'll not get into uh, for undergraduate students here. But using that, we have studied certain kinetic aspects of this machine called ribosome and using uh, uh, no, this book actually is a very good guide to the concept of first passage plot times. And using this, we explained certain uh, experimental observation, which was earlier a mystery. And uh, that mystery came from experiments done by Joachim Frank, who uh, actually got Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, he did the experiment using cryo electron microscopy. And Ruben Gonzalez did the experiment using what is called single molecule FRET. And there was this apparent contradiction between the experiments and we collaborated with them. So my student, Ajit Sharma, Ruben's student, uh, Colin Kins Thompson, uh, Joachim and Ruben, we all teamed up together and explained what was an experimental mystery. Again, something that I'll not get into, but I'm just trying to convey the message 
that these molecular machines exhibit all kinds of interesting phenomena and the physics particularly statistical mechanics and thermodynamics is a very useful tool for explaining many of these apparent mysteries these machines that i'm talking about now you know they are information processing machines so let me skip this slide i would just like to mention that these machines are sometimes called tape copying turing machines and turing machine is something that comes in the context of theory of computation so this you know work that we do in the context of this molecular machines like ribosome they have a you know, lot of uh, similarity or overlap with the concept of theory of computation which are based also on turing machines let me skip all this because they will take me to a lot of technicalities i don't intend to get into all that uh, there is one aspect of these machines that when they move on a track they can slip and then if they slip they will make a protein which is not the intended protein but a different protein and this phenomena is called ribosomal frame shift and it turns out that nature sometimes does it intentionally and you know intentionally it has been done by hiv that deadly virus it's a so it is not a, again a theorist imagination such slippage of machines on their track you can imagine that slippage can do take and uh, can take place but it does take place and that gives rise to this phenomena which is exploited by viruses like hiv and we have developed a theory for this some aspects of this and this was done in collaboration with my student babia mishra and again with my collaborator gunter schutz from julish germany i again not get into the technical details of that so in the last few minutes let me emphasize that it is a multidisciplinary research area so it involves physics non equilibrium statistical mechanics fluid dynamics etc it involves mathematical modeling and of course dependent on the concepts of probability and statistics it also involves biochemistry because reaction kinetics that the fuel and the motors undergo they are to be studied with the help of the kinetics of biochemical reactions now system biology and system theory is an integral part of this molecular cell biology of course deals with the inventory of the parts of these machines nanotechnology of course is part of this in the sense that these are nano scale machines and the artificial nano machines that are made is now of course is an area of research in uh, nanotechnology sometimes it's called bottom up nanotechnology of course uh, the design of these machines can be changed and the way to change them with the help of genetic mutations so genetics also is a part of this enterprise and finally as i have argued that the, some of these machines have a lot of similarity with turing machines and that's why it has uh, they have a lot of in, you know overlap with information theory communication theory and computation theory etc so this is a multidisciplinary enterprise as was mentioned in the title of this talk so i would like to quote from this poem of robert frost it says before i build a wall i would ask to know what i was walling in or walling out something there is that doesn't love a wall that wants it down and wall in this case is the rigid disciplinary boundaries something that doesn't love the wall is a progress in the science of molecular machines so we should break down these walls between different disciplines and team up with experts from other disciplines to understand the mechanism of molecular machines and eventually to synthesize molecular machines so i'd like to acknowledge a uh, first large number of students who have worked with me and large number of collaborators from all over the world and i have been generously supported by uh, government of india my own institute by max planck institute uh, japan society for promotion of science nsf alexander von humboldt foundation and so on and thank you for your attention thank you thank you sir for your nice presentation i hope our students have learned a lot of new things uh, in this field so uh, we have got one question uh, in inbox so what is the stochastic thermodynamics and what is the difference between normal okay. thermodynamics so 
Thermodynamics deals with macroscopic objects. Macroscopic basically means the extreme case. Thermodynamics actually deals with systems which do not have surfaces or boundaries. So the system is effectively infinite. On the other hand, when we deal with molecular machines or motors, as I said, they are of the order of few nanometers. So then you ask the question that the laws of thermodynamics that we learned for macroscopically large objects, are they applicable to such small scale? Now, it has been realized in the last 20, 25 years that there are large number of deviations. And one extreme case is the second law of thermodynamics. Second law of thermodynamics says that uh, for an isolated system, in a process, entropy cannot decrease it can only increase for irreversible processes, right? However, if you have a very small system, then the entropy can even decrease. It's only on the average in, you know, entropy has to increase. So there is an apparent violation of second law. It's only because of something called fluctuation. And that comes because of the randomness that comes at the level of small objects like molecular machines. So at that level, you cannot apply the thermodynamics that you learn in undergraduate courses, which deals with macroscopically large objects. So a modification of that, that takes into account these fluctuations of the objects. Okay, so that is stochastic basically means randomness, okay, in the processes. So you have to deal, um, you have to use a version of thermodynamics which has been developed in recent years is called stochastic thermodynamics. However, macroscopic thermodynamics is not violated. It's only when you go to the limit of large system, which we call thermodynamic limit, we recover our good old thermodynamics. The deviations from that occur only when you have a finite system and the smaller the system, larger is going to be the role of the fluctuations. Thank you, sir. We have uh, some question in comment. So, is it possible to transmit data through DNA? Transmit data. I data. don't know. Okay, whether you know, it's not a data transmission, but the process itself is information transmission. I'll explain why. See, this information, genetic information, is encoded in the sequence that you have on the DNA. So, DNA uses a language which has four letters: A, T, C, G. So unlike computers, which is binary zero one, so two letter here you have four letters and message is encoded with the help of these four letters in the sequence in which this ATCG appear. So then when that message is first transcribed, so it's called transcription onto RNA. RNA also uses a four letter language. It's called AUCG instead of ATCG. So that message is then further translated from a four letter uh, alphabet okay, to a language which is 20 letter alphabet and that is called a protein. So information is indeed transmitted, transmitted from what is encoded on a DNA to a protein. So information does get transmitted, but not along the DNA, but from DNA to a protein. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So we have another question. This may be the last question. So why entropy is ever increasing despite ever increasing population? Sorry, can you repeat that question again? So why entropy is ever increasing despite mm. ever increasing population? I don't know uh, what is the connection with population, but uh, you know when we state the second law of thermodynamics, you know we have to make it very precise. If we say that entropy is increasing, then the system has to be isolated. If the system is not isolated, entropy need not decrease. Now I can give a very simple example of an object which actually is getting, you know, uh, it's in contact with uh, say ice, okay? And the object is at room temperature. So obviously energy is flowing from the system to the ice. And so there's a heat flow going from the system to the ice. So in that case, of course, you know, the system will lose entropy. So you know, it, the entropy can decrease, 
the statement of second law is that for an isolated system only then the entropy will increase in any process in the system when you remove some constraint so if you now say that the universe is isolated i don't know about this universe but if i assume that the universe is isolated then second law says that in all the processes that are going on within this universe entropy can only increase it cannot decrease mm -hmm. Now, what is the connection of that with the population increase? I could not answer that. I mean, I could not understand the question and I'm afraid I cannot answer it. Sir, thank you, sir, for your nice presentation and nice discussion. And I think we have learned a lot of things. So we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology, sir. Actually, it's my honor and privilege to host you in, in my international physics webinar. And hopefully in near future, we'll arrange another uh, interesting and exciting webinar with you, sir, if you have a time. So thanks again, sir. Thank you very much. I, I thank also your audience. Thank you. Bye. Bye for today, sir. Bye. Thanks, sir.